And when I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. And if we're talking tight ends and we're going into round two, maybe round three, give me Ian Thomas, please. Just let's, I mean, let's just do the damn thing. Just based on giving his overall ability. Um, again, I like his arm. I think he can make every throw. The pick at number 12 is in. Welcome to Cover One, the NFL Draft Podcast. Joining me today on a Wednesday night, the night before Christmas Day. It is Christmas Eve. I feel like a little kid, and I'm with my father, Michael Kiss <laughs> of Bleeding Green Nation. Mike, my man, how are we doing? I am doing really well, man. I, I am anxious for this next 24, 23 hours, whatever it is, to just be over as we're recording here. And, I mean, we've had all the takes, and we're going to have some more in this show. But I feel like it's been done to death, and it just needs to happen so we can analyze where all these great prospects are going and how they fit and everything like that. Because that's the most important thing, Russ, the fit. We can have our rankings all we want, but the fit is what exactly. is important. <laughs> right. It, well, exactly. And if, if the glove doesn't fit, as OJ says, then I didn't do it. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but no, like I, I agree, man. Like this is, uh, you know, the best time for sure. But then I always enjoy like that Sunday or Saturday evening, Sunday after the draft and just sit down. And I like picking like six, seven, maybe even 10 guys of just like schematically that makes sense for a team. And I yeah. like writing articles about it. And I like, you know, it allows me to go into game pass, search some stuff and then go into, you know, the college tape a little bit more. And it allowed me to like find guys that I missed like Jamon Moore last year for the Packers. Um, I don't know if you had a guy last year that maybe you studied for maybe the Eagles in specific or somebody that you didn't get to watch originally. Do you have anybody offhand that you can remember? Oh, for the Eagles last year, I mean, as far as like their day three guys, like Matt Pryor, I didn't, I didn't get to, but he makes a ton of sense and he, he might uh, preclude, pre preclude the Eagles from taking like an uh, interior offensive lineman later in the draft. But we can talk about that when we talk about, you know, what the Eagles are looking for. But yeah, there, there are plenty of guys that, that shock me every year. I, what was the Vincent Smith, the, yep. the wide receiver for the Texans who I hyped up throughout the pre-draft process comes and catches a touchdown against the Eagles. So that was bittersweet. There's always those weird guys, man, that you're like, I like this guy. And then he pops up like, you know, later in the year after you haven't heard anything about him. There's also guys you, you've never even seen that, that end up doing something like Philip Lindsay wasn't one of the guys that I watched in the pre-draft process last year and ended up being a doggone good running back. So, I mean, Technically, that's a miss on my part, but there's always someone that surprises you. So you got to do as much work as you possibly can throughout this process. Yeah, and I like the way that you described it. Bittersweet, and that's really like how this process goes sometimes. You miss on guys, you hit on guys, you feel good, you feel the lows. And right now, it's kind of bittersweet. Like, we're ready for it to be done, but at the same time, we're really anxious to get going. So let's get going on the Eagles and their needs. What are the Philadelphia Eagles' needs, whether it's at pick 25 or somewhere in the second round with uh, everything that they have going on. I know they got two second round picks. So what are some of their needs in this draft? Yeah, just, just hitting them kind of quick. I mean, offensive tackle is something you got to look towards long-term. Jason Peters played 80% of the snaps last year, which was a lot, but he also played through a bunch of different injuries and was in and out of games and whatnot. Luckily, didn't miss a significant amount of time. I don't think Halabuli Batibatai is the long-term answer there. He's nothing but a, a spot starter, which is fine. I mean, that's valuable in this league, but as far as sure up that, that long-term answer at left tackle, I think that's really incredibly important especially for a guy like Carson wants to keep him healthy and then you know you look in the offensive lines all, all along the trenches interior offensive line Jason Kelsey considered retirement during this year so maybe they're going to be looking at a center you know Brandon Brooks is coming back from an Achilles tear that he suffered during a playoff game against the Saints so there's a short-term need there and then there's the also the tentative contract that they have with Isaac Siamalu who took over the left guard spot they let Wisniewski walk so there's a depth and there's also a possible upgrade for a, what I think is a replacement level starter so needs come in a lot of different forms and fashion so there's replacement level guys that you can upgrade or there's just holes I don't think the Eagles have many holes but I think they can improve depth and you know especially at the and you look at the long-term picture 
you look at the safety position, Malcolm Jenkins wants to play 10 years in the league. He's entering his 10th year in the league, getting a little long in the tooth. Rodney McLeod's coming off a knee injury, restructured his contract. They could be looking at safety there, a long-term answer. They also play a lot of big nickel, big dimes, so that can be a short-term solution there as well, even though they sign Andrew Sandejo. Uh, linebacker, you could replace or try to upgrade on Camus Grugier Hill or LJ Fort, who I love from the Steelers that they brought in. I mean, there's a ton of different places where they have a quote-unquote need uh, but luckily for the Eagles for the, I think for the second year in a row they have a lot of flexibility thanks to what they did in free agency and Howie Roseman doing his thing to where they don't necessarily have to reach for something so you could like if you were to look at the roster and you were to put out your rankings for what they needed it might look entirely different from mine and we would be probably right for just different reasons right and I like and I feel like also too is like I like that you brought up offensive tackle. I feel like that's been a need for a while, just simply because Jason Peters, it feels like he's 100, but at the same time, he's only like, what, 37, 30, would you say 37, 36? I think he'll be turning 38, if I'm not mistaken, coming into this season. Right. So, I mean, like, he's an older guy, and he's been playing forever, and he's been showing that he's been getting dinged up. So, I like, I wouldn't be surprised at 25 if they win offensive tackle, but I guess it would depend on who's on the board. But I want to ask you, I I, kind of want to play – a little game real fast. I know we didn't talk about it, but I want to throw a few names at you at 25 and just get yes or like F no. Um, okay. So like at 25, Cody Ford. Yes. This is, Hunter, yeah, yeah. Devil, big time. Go ahead. Okay. okay. D- Dalton Reisner. No. Okay. Um, it's going to be rich. I don't think it would make sense to do this at 25. So <laughs> I'm going to say it anyways. Yanni could just. Uh, that was a great sell, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I kind of sold it up short. Okay. So yeah. moving to the other side, safety, which is another position. And I think that's the direction they're going to go. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. Absolutely. Jonathan Abram. No. He's my eighth ring safety. I'm, I'm, yeah, no. Limited guy. No. Okay. I like it because I agree with you because I don't think he's that great in coverage. I think as a box safety, absolutely sure. Aggressive as hell. I just don't see where he fits with the Eagles, um, but I have seen that name circled around. And then another safety, Juan Thornhill, Virginia. Yeah, if it's 1999, I'm going Abram. But in 2000, <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, Juan Thornhill's really climbing up some boards. I would not be surprised to see him in the first round. I know other guys like Chauncey Nasir, and then also Darnell Savage from Maryland are getting first round hype. So I wouldn't be surprised to see them there. It would be rich for me but I'd be okay with it. I really do like Juan Thornhill. I have a second round grade on him. I've got seven safeties with it, with at least a second round grade on him. Abrams just outside of that. So if they took Thornhill, I think it would be a little bit rich. I would prefer a trade down in that situation, depending on how the board looks. But you know what, at the end of the day, when he's making plays back, back there and ball production was a thing that they lacked in that secondary last year. And he had a ton of interceptions at his time in Virginia. I'd be okay with it. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's really hard to like, narrow it down as far as what safety would be but I think Chauncey Gardner Johnson would certainly be like the best fit but like at at 53 57 I still feel like and like you said you have seven safeties there I, I think it's very much in the cards for them not to go safety in the first round and go in the second round so yeah. rank their needs what are their big like out of their needs how would you rank it and what direction would you want them to go yeah, me and Benjamin Solak had this conversation on the Kiss and Solak show pretty recently, and I feel like I've completely changed them around again because, again, you can be right for a lot of different reasons in this case. But number one, I'd go offensive tackle. It's a position I've been banging the table for for a couple years now to secure that position. I was never a big B, big V believer. So, and Jason Peters is getting a little bit long in the tooth. So I want to protect my quarterback. That's one of my biggest priorities. So I'll go offensive tackle number one. I'll go safety number two, like we talked about, that long-term plan. They also have the short-term use in the big packages. And then the third one, I'll go with interior offensive line for Kelsey possibly retiring the issue with Brooks and his injury in Ciamalo, like I mentioned already. I'll go, uh, I'll go edge, man. I want some edge help. I, are, are we sold on Derek Barnett yet? Cause, because I'm not. I know that's not a popular opinion, but give me someone on the opposite side of Brandon Graham. And there's a guy that I love. It's my dream scenario, but we'll talk about that. Uh, and then I'll go into your defensive line. I, I, even though they signed Malik Jackson, I think they can still add to that rotation and allow Fletcher Cox to get back down to 60% of his snaps. 
he was so effective at 80% of his snaps last year. It's crazy. But there were times in the fourth quarter where you could see that he needed a blow and needed to take some snaps off. So I would go into your defensive line. The Eagles love to build through the trenches. So I think they're in line with that one as well. Yeah, like I feel like they could like, – like you mentioned, you've, you've thrown out a ton of needs. I think that they could go in literally any direction, um, and it wouldn't be surprising. But at the same time, there's got to be a pick that would surprise you or a couple of picks. So – at 25 tomorrow, and maybe if they maybe they don't even keep the pick. I don't know. I mean, you never know you, what's on the board. Who knows? But if there was something to surprise you, is there a couple of players that if, if they were selected, uh, what would you do? It, it's really interesting to me with Kelsey because there's a guy that I absolutely love that plays his position that when I watch him, and I'm you know I'm not a, a comp guy. I hate comps. Yes, they but- suck. Yeah, they're terrible. They, they often lack context and, and lack context and, and all that stuff. But at the center position, you watch Garrett Bradbury. He looks uh, exactly like Jason Kelsey. I mean, yes. th- there's there's no way around it. The the athleticism they have, they, you know, he's the grim reacher, quote unquote. <laughs> uh, Daniel Jeremiah gave him that nickname, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Like that's like that's but Owen Reese. He was recently on uh, BGN Radio recently for a draft special. He called him Baby Kelsey. So he agrees with that too. And he's awesome at interior offensive line prospects and evaluating them. Mm-hmm. So that's like – I know they gave Kelsey the extension. But, you know, in a pinch, Bradbury can possibly fill in at guard. They can see how that works out for a little bit. But, you know, overall, I think he's a center. And I think he is a seamless transition from Kelsey. Obviously, Kelsey, the best center – in the league in the last two years, in my opinion, and a crazy Pro Bowl snub this year. But if they were to get a guy like Bradbury, and I'm not saying that he's going to be Kelsey right away. Keep in mind, Kelsey was a six-round pick. It took him about three years to kind of reach his potential and really make his name known. But Bradbury might have a similar arc, has the same strengths and exact same weaknesses, you know, bull rush and power and, and big guys and taking on strength like that. But in space, freaking fantastic. So he would be one. The other one that would surprise me, And it's not because I wouldn't take him there. It's because if he falls, wow, uh, it would be Montez Sweat from from Mississippi State because the enlarged heart thing. Some people are saying that he's off their board. People said that Leighton Vanderess was off their board last year. He still went 19, and it only takes one. And the draft is only one iteration of a million different outcomes, so you never know. Mm -hmm. But it would be fascinating to me if Montez Sweat is there at 25 and the Eagles were to take him because there's rumors that he might drop out of the first round, which is interesting to me. Yeah, the, like the, with Montez Sweat, it's it's very – it's odd. I, I, like I've got him as my eighth-ranked player. I think he's phenomenal. I love the blend of power, speed, athletic ability is certainly there. The, you've got the length as well. I mean, he's long as hell. Um, yeah. But but going back to Bradbury, I like it would be somewhat surprising. It would be a great pick. I love, I love everything that you said. But I just don't know if he'll certainly be there. I mean, like there's just so many teams that are in front there that make a lot of sense. Like Houston – Maybe, but I think they need an offensive tackle, but like they certainly need just help up front. So he could be a fit there. Minnesota makes a ton of sense at 18. I talked with Luke Inman of uh, zone coverage, great guy and and great stuff from him. And he was all about it at 18. And I kind of agree. uh, Most certainly Um, you have Baltimore as well. I think that's just kind of a natural fit as well. And then maybe, maybe Seattle, if they move out of 21, I don't think a team would like trade up to get a center, but you never know. But uh, I, mean, I think it might be interesting, though, because it, it, he's a very scheme specific guy for me, which is hard to like figure out where you want to rank him, because I would rank him much lower if he was going to a predominantly gap scheme. I have him very oh, high. Yeah. No, you want him in a zone for sure. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that kind of helps him maybe fall down the board. A little bit. And one last name I'll throw out there just to surprise that I have ranked really low. They brought him in for a visit. Nikhil Harry, if they if they drafted him at 25, he'd be like, what the heck is going on? So, How would you feel about that, though? I'd feel awful. <laughs> <laughs> I have serious concerns about the guy. I mean, he plays soft. He's going to have to rework his releases. I mean, we might even have to move him into the slot a little bit. Like, I, I think that's the ultimate thing with all this you know, interest that they're drumming up at wide receiver and all the official visits that they had. 20% of their official visits have been wide receiver and half of them are this big body type. And a lot of them have slot experience like Jalen Hurd, Nikhil Harry, so on and so forth. And then the other half are like Michael Hardman and Marquise Brown, like these smaller speed guys that you can mm-hmm. definitely project to, to the slot. I think if they draft a big guy, they might want to kick in Deshaun Jackson and give him more like 30 to 40% slot reps, which he hasn't seen in a while. Tampa Bay used him less in the slot than any other team that he's been with. So there's a lot of different ways that you can play with this i think they're looking at speed but 
yeah, Nikhil Harry would surprise the hell out of me there. Yeah, I think in the first round he would surprise me. I mean, I like him, and I it would. I, I mean, I guess it. I guess he's my, it, he's my 40th ranked overall player. I mean, it's not like it's that big of a reach, but at the same time, like that's also a tentative 40. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I mean, I've got him 28th on my board just because of, I, I love his versatility. I love the way that he can really just go anywhere outside, inside. I mean, yeah. I like, they basically used him Kalen Balaj, but he was better. He was a better version of him. Like not running the football, like a running back, but like he was out there in wildcat and everything like that. So yeah. it was, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe there is a team out there, maybe Seattle or something, or again, maybe the Eagles. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but AJ let's... Brown's getting first round hype. He's an official visit. Like that's, that's kind of a little crazy to me too. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> no, no, that's, I mean, seriously, I, like I was doing my mock draft today and it like it's done, but I have basically 47 players going in the first round. I like, <laughs> I, I have so many guys that I love in this draft. And then I have so many like, just questions like I really like I, this is the weirdest year ever I feel because so many things could happen and we yeah. just don't know but we, we specifically don't know about day two of the draft and day three of the draft um what are some names that you like for that portion of the draft I love the second and third day of the draft yeah for the second day some guys that I'm really keying on and, and I know he's getting first round hype right now but like Darnell Savage Jr the the safety out of Maryland and and I give these guys designations these safeties because so number one I, I really value versatility and that's something that the Eagles safety coach Tim Hawk really values as well that and ball production you need to be able to roll your safeties and they need to be able to play deep middle that's just how it has to happen mm-hmm. but right now Savage isn't ready for like that extensive deep middle role even though he has some reps there and whatnot because he's more comfortable coming downhill and, yes. and early in his career I want to play him closer to the line but I mean, guy ran a four three six. He's got he's got some ball skills. He, he can eventually develop into that single high safety type type role. So he can have all of those different roles as at his disposal. I think Chauncey Gardner Johnson is ready for that role sooner than him. But that's really intriguing to me. JJ Arcega Whiteside is a guy that I'm higher on a lot. The wide receiver out of Stanford. Uh, he's 38th on my big board. Tall tree. I mean, there are scouts <laughs> and I. Yeah, I I can confirm this, by the way. At the Stanford Pro Day, there was one scout that had him at 438. There was another scout that had him at 439. Now, he's got a track background, so that's a little bit of a red herring, I guess, with him. So you have to, like, take that into context. Like, this guy actually knows how to run a 40. If Mm -hmm. he didn't, maybe he's more like a 455 guy. But at the same time, like, the guy trains for it, and that shows his work ethic, and he's a really big dude, knows how to box out, uses his size well. Like, I'm taking a swing on him before I'm taking a swing on Nikhil Harry and Hakeem Butler. Uh, Hakeem Butler, I have him higher than both of them. And then if you're, you know, looking for an edge guy, <sighs> Christian Miller is super intriguing to me. And mm-hmm. the injuries concern me. And it, But at the same time, the guy can run under a table. And I know he didn't really test in the three cone, if I'm not mistaken. And that's a shame. I wanted to see him in Mobile for the Senior Bowl to, mm-hmm. to see how he held up. But, uh, I mean, I'll take those skills and, uh, and mold it for Christian Miller there at Alabama in day two. So those are like my early day two guys. I kind of center around 53, 57. If they fall to us, then I'm really, you know, thinking about it hard. Yeah, I, I'm late to the party on Christian Miller, but man, oh man, and Darnell Savage as well. Darnell Savage is always around the football. Like every single play, it feels like he's – Tone center. It, yeah, and it, like he is certainly better coming downhill than he is just kind of in space and, and coming over the top and things. But like he is – He's going to be a like we talked about scheme fits and things like that at the top of the show. He's going to be a player that I go back and probably watch more of, and then when he gets drafted, I'm going to find out why he fits that team, whatever team drafts him. Um, I've got but, one more comp for you in day two. Are you ready for this? Yes. Uh, is, have, it, is it Ryan Finley? Please. No, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, my I've again very few comps that I do, luckily, because I don't have to, but scouts do, and that's a shame. But Jay Sternberger, the tight end from Texas A&M, Zach Ertz, baby. Might as well be Zach Ertz. They get open in the same ways. They run basically the same 40. Like, this is, they gave me such big time Zach Ertz flashes. I am in love with his game. I think he's going to be a really doggone good football player. Everybody's fawning over TJ Hawkinson and, and Noah Font, and rightfully so. By the way, big shocker, Eagles taking Noah Font at 25. Let's go 13 personnel, baby. And spread it out. Go no huddle. That'd be a, a nightmare. But, yeah, Jay Sternberger, man, just knows how to get open. He's not the most athletic dude. 
but he's nuanced in his routes and he's and he's good after the catch too. I think that's what separates him from Ertz. Obviously, he's not as polished at, as Ertz is at this point in his career, but like Sternberger's got a lot of tools that I just love, man. Yeah, I I've I, I like him a lot. I mean, I think he's a, a player that you know, like you mentioned after the catch, I like his ability to get just vertically up the field. Like he just he does so many of the little things right. And like we always say in football, the little things are the big things. You do those little things right, you're going to win every single time. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think day two, he's certainly going to be a good find. Um, and you got me thinking pro comps now. So I'm going to throw mine out there, and it's a yeah. safety. Um, Kari Willis of Michigan State, down at the Senior Bowl, smart guy. Um, I think he can do a little bit of everything. I think the only thing that hurts him is he doesn't really do like one thing better than the other, you know, kind of mm. type thing. Nothing really stands like a, like out. a flat line when you grade them. Like right. everything's average or above average, but it just kind of like looks look, looks like a flat line. Yeah, he's, he's like a good player, but you're like I, I like you don't stand out in any one area that I can't be <laughs> like, oh, you're great. But I think he's like Glover Quinn Jr. Like yeah. I, he just I think he's a perfect fit for for a team probably like on the third day of the draft that needs a, a safety and whether you're running cover two or you you want to put him in the you know in the slot or, uh, you know, put him down to the box. I think he could do any of that because he, he shows it. My, does he do it as good as, like, Darnell Savage coming downhill or, or Abram in the box? No, but at the same time, like, I think he's a great fit. So, I don't know. Anyways, um, I want some trade predictions. I, I don't know if you have any for me, but I, 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 I want some trade predictions. And please tell me it's your rival teams in the NFC East going after Daniel Jones. Washington's going to do something stupid. stupid. Yeah. Well, they, <laughs> if they go after Haskins, I'm cool with it. But Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get Haskins. If they want to go to top five for Daniel Jones, I mean, you might as well. Like, I, I think I said this on Twitter. Just don't press, you know, just don't hit the reset button. Just hold it down and hope it just factory resets. It's just, <laughs> that's insane, man. To, to rate up to top five is what I heard. I mean, I saw Mike Garofalo talking about it. And then I also saw that Greg Gabe, if you want to trust him, Gabe, Greg Gabriel, who's a lunatic, but he also said that he's heard the same thing. Like a lot of people are hearing that the Redskins are really poking around at trading into the top five. Mm -hmm. And if it's for Daniel Jones, I'll lose my freaking mind. I mean, Kyler Murray is the only first round grade I have on this quarterback class. And then it goes to the third round. Like I'm not even a big Haskins guy, but I still like get why people like him. I mm-hmm. won't dig my heels in on, on, on a lot of these quarterbacks. But at the same time, if Washington does that, they, they swoop in front of New York to take Daniel Jones. And then what, what is New York going to do? Like, that's fascinating to me how that all is going to play out because New York might have to trade up. They might have to feel like they have to trade up. They're going to waste even more assets than the assets they would have had if they had taken a quarterback last year. So <laughs> all of that's very interesting to me. Um, I, I think Washington ultimately – God, man, I, Dan Snyder is taking over the war room. So, yeah, I think they trade up and they get real aggressive. Last time he took over the war room, quote, unquote, he went up and traded up for uh, Robert Griffin uh, Jr. So, yeah, uh, he, he wants to go get a quarterback, and they need one. They desperately need one. I just well, don't think yeah, and if they, time and place for it. Yeah, and if they go up and they get Daniel Jones, just Tom and Baratheon yourself out a window, please. Like, Washington, <laughs> seriously, right. just, just get out. Because Daniel Jones is – I don't like he's what's let me look at my freaking board here. What where is he at? Like 78. Not even Yeah. No, 76 on my board. He's down there. I mean, I'm with you. I like these quarterbacks, I don't have a first round grade on any of them. I just no. like I'd be lying if I sat here and said, Oh, I like Kyler Murray more than the guys last year or Dwayne yeah. Haskins. Like it just be I'd be lying. So yeah. um now do I think that they could move up to like three or four? Sure. I'm I'm curious of Oakland. I know Benjamin Albright had tweeted that out, keep an eye on the Raiders and the Redskins and like that stuff I don't know how truthful that is I feel like it's pretty I feel pretty confident in it we have no idea what Oakland's going to do they have no history we have no idea they sent the scouts home like uh, they're leaking out that they like TJ Hawkinson at at fourth overall they could trade Derek Carr they could not Kyler Murray the confidence at him you know going number one is all down like every nothing means anything at this point is basically what I'm getting at now if I if if I can give you one trade up my my dream scenario here for the trade up scenario is okay so brian burns starts to fall because there's a disconnect between how um a lot of people in the media and people like me and you that that you know are our evaluators uh, that the way they view brian burns versus the way that the nf the, the nfl views brian burns and i think that's why people think that he might not fall because they see all the media stuff but what the mocks are telling me is that brian burns is being selected at 19th to the tennessee titans uh, uh-huh. in, some box he's being selected at 16 
like that would be a steal for the Titans if they were to have Harold Landry and Brian Burns fall to them in consecutive years. That's some Icarus flying too close to the sun type stuff. So if I'm Howie and I want to add another edge rusher, I am trading in front of the Tennessee Titans. I am giving up a second to go to 15 or 16 or 14 around that area, maybe even to 18 if I can couple a fourth with something else. I am trading up if I am the Eagles and I'm going to get Brian Burns. That is my dream scenario. Yesterday was Brian Burns' birthday. Happy 21st <laughs> birthday, Brian. And I celebrated it by hyping that trade all freaking day. I'm going to talk it into existence. But, like, I'm not the biggest Brian Burns supporter. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not. He's 20th on my board. But I do have him in that range. Mm. And I, I find it interesting that you would be okay. I, like, I, I see why you like him. Don't get me wrong. But Philly moving up to get him, cool, whatever. Does that – and I know Jim Schwartz loves – pass rushers I know he loves defensive linemen that's mm-hmm. his thing he's you know he's got him in his shed he's got his weight his shake weight going in one hand and film going in the other I know we do the same thing but um with that I mean does that make Derek Barnett like potentially just tradable like could you move on from him no I don't think they want to move on from him but it's definitely going to be someone that you're going to put in the rotation early on in the year and then you're going to get him in an off-season weight training program. You're going to put more weight on him. Again, he's young. He's lighter. He played at 235, which is super light. He came to the combine at 249, which is nice. He could still add some more weight. I think Brandon Graham plays at like 255, 260. So he doesn't have a long way to go. Uh, but like year one, Barnett's going to go prove himself. But then if Barnett does go prove himself and then Burns is also good, well, now you're in a situation where, I mean, we could pay Barnett or we could trade Barnett. Who, well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Would you trade Barnett? I mean. Not immediately, no. It would take oh. after the first year. I would have to be really confident, really confident that Brian Burns is like the guy. And even then, a year removed, you've got another two years of Brandon Graham. So you're thinking, okay, when can we get out of that contract? He's going to be 34. You. you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of different scenarios there, but it gives them the flexibility. And if it ends up being a scenario where Derek Barnett and Brian Burns are both really good. Well, they can start together for the future, or you trade Derek Barnett for like what? I mean, what did Frank Clark get? What did D Ford get? Like, right. You see what I'm saying? Like, you yeah. can get a lot of value out of that. That's a high value position. We're talking about trading Nelson Aguilar for like maybe a fifth if they trade like a wide receiver if, if they draft the wide receiver. There's so much value in that as position, and just having it not only for your pass rush but also just for the value it represents as trade value is great too. Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically the second premier position in football outside of quarterback. I mean, right. people pay the premium for it for whatever reason. I mean, it is what it is. But uh, let's circle it back around. Let's close this thing out. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, and that is basically the Eagles. You got the card. The pick is in at 25. The draft is right now. Who are they taking? Yeah, so we did this for the SB Nation writer's mock, and it was interesting because the way the board fell and Christian Wilkins was there. Not everyone believes that Christian Wilkins will be there. And the choice for us, the the big choices were Christian Wilkins, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. I'd be okay with that selection. We didn't really even really talk about Marquise Brown at the time. We just started ramping up that talk in the last week as that fire started to grow. Yeah. So we didn't consider that. He's lower on my board anyway. I wouldn't, I, I get the, I, I get why I wouldn't take him there. Um, <laughs> Josh Jacobs was another guy. Maybe mm-hmm. Oakland takes him at 24 and saves us from that, from that uh, headache of, of having to consider the, the running back there. Even though I like Josh Jacobs, man, he's really good. And if they took him at 25, I would finally shut up all the people that, that are saying that how he won't take a running back at 25. But, you know, I mean, Chris Listner was, a, was another fit for us. If Garrett Bradbury there, it's so fun. But I'll go with the guy that we took in the SB Nation writer's mock that, that I pounded the table for. I'll go with Christian Wilkins as the, uh, as the pick at 25. But in my heart, in my heart, I'm trading up. And getting and Brian Birds. And we're getting – I'm speaking it into existence. This is, my, <laughs> this is my low, you know, seductive voice to the gods to, to let this happen. <laughs> Oh man, I, you know, I can't wait to watch. I, it's going to be amazing. I'll probably be freaking out live on Twitter a little bit, drinking and chugging water, AKA Coors Light. So uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, Mike, where can we find you on Twitter, my man? Michael Kist NFL, that's K-I-S-T. Also follow us at BGN Radio, at BGN underscore radio, or just go to any podcast app and type in uh, Bleeding Green Nation. We have tons of draft coverage, tons of you know, general NFL draft coverage, along with uh, the Eagles-related stuff, if you're an Eagles fan. Welcome. 
you have found your mecca. Uh, but yeah, that's where that's where you can find all our stuff. Bleedinggreennation.com. Go to the yeah. site. Guys, smash the follow button. Check it out in your podcast apps, iTunes, whatever. It's a top 50 podcast. It really is. It's great stuff. They've got like over 800 five stars. It's, in, it's insane. Yeah. Um, smash the follow button. But that's Michael Kist. I am Russell Brown. Until next time, this is Cover One, the NFL Draft Podcast.